All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Rhonda Sincavage with the National Trust, and I'm glad you're here to join us for the last of the post-conference workshops for Pass Forward 2021. Uh, today, we'll be talking about amending National Register nominations. And before we get started, I wanted to uh, share just a few logistical items with you. Um, this is being recorded and the recording will be sent to the email that you use to register for this session. It'll also be located in the forum webinar library for viewing after the, uh, the session. Closed captioning has been enabled and you can activate that at the bottom of your screen on your control panel. And then finally, we ask everyone to abide by our conference code of conduct, which I will be posting in the chat. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce folks on our panel today. Uh, Jim Gabbert, who is the historian with the National Park Service. Lena McDonald, who is the National and State Register Historian with the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. And finally, Greg Smith, who is the Federal Programs Coordinator for the Texas Historical Commission. So I'm handing it over to you, Jim. Let's get started. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, slide. Um, my name is Jim Gabbert. I'm a historian with the National Park Service at the National Register of Historic Places program. Um, I've been with the program for 14 years as of Monday. So uh, prior to that, I worked for the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office. Prior to that, I worked for the Indiana uh, statewide nonprofit now called Indiana Landmark. So I've been in this business of looking at and evaluating historic resources for <clears throat> uh, all of my professional career. So um, slide please. We're here to talk about amending National Register nominations. Uh, a lot of people weren't aware that they could be amended, that uh, they weren't set in stone, but nominations are living documents. They're open working files. They paint a picture of a property at the time of its nomination. So there are all kinds of things that can be changed in nominations. They can be uh, technical changes, addresses, for example, um, you know, when uh, 911 service came in and a lot of places changed their addresses, when uh, old nominations just gave a, a general location at the corner of X and Y. So we can make those kinds of technical changes, but more importantly, we can add new information to nominations. We can make new arguments for or even against significance. We can reassess periods of significance for a property, and we can, especially those that have utilized the arbitrary 50-year cutoff, and even sometimes we can revisit boundaries, uh, expanding boundaries in some case, cases, contracting them in others, and in some cases actually defining the boundaries. Uh, you'd be surprised at some of the early nominations and uh, their lack of actual locational information. Slide. So anyone can create what we call additional documentation. Amending a nomination, uh, we refer to as AD or additional docu documentation. But it must be processed through our regular process. That means that only the nominating authorities can send uh, the request to the keeper. The nominating authorities are the State Historic Preservation Office, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, or the Federal Preservation Officer for those properties under tribal or federal jurisdiction. So in some cases, this new information will necess necessitate review by a state review board, especially if you're adding new criteria, uh, new areas of significance, uh, or if you're changing any of the boundaries, but others can come straight from the nominating authority. So those technical changes or changes to add information that is not necessarily changing uh, a criterion. Slide, please. 
So how and why do we do this? The National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 is what created the National Register of Historic Places. And it authorizes the Secretary of the Interior to expand, that is add to, and maintain, which would be updating the National Register of Historic Places. So the keeper of the National Register, who is an actual person and who acts with the delegated authority of the secretary, may accept nominations for new properties, that is expand the register, and accept new information regarding listed properties, maintaining the National Register. The regulations uh, 36 CFR Part 60 set forth the procedures for nominations and how nominating authorities process nominations, and the National Park Service must follow these uh, regulations in order to actually list or accept nominations or additional documentation. The National Register has been around since 1966. We've produced many, many uh, guidelines, guidance papers, uh, National Register bulletins, for example, that can answer a lot of the questions you may have about the National Register of Historic Places. So please do refer to our uh, guidance before you start uh, wading into the, the process of either nominating or amending a nomination. Slide, please. So why do we do this? So if you've any of you have ever looked at older listings, especially those from the 1970s and 1980s, you'll soon see that there may not be a lot of real information in those documents. Uh, the documentation standards have changed and even acknowledging that some may consider today's standards as too onerous, we can all recognize the inadequacy of many of those early nominations. For example, prior to the creation of the tax credit program in 1976, there was no requirement for inventorying all of the resources in a historic district, whether using a map or a list. And there was no requirement for an evaluation of that individual resources status as contributing or not being contributing to the significance of that district. So old nominations for historic districts are ripe for revisiting uh, whether you're gonna change a boundary or not, just having an inventory of the resources within it is very helpful. So while we encourage properties to be evaluated holistically, that is all possible criteria or areas of significance are identified, the truth is that it only takes one criterion and one area of significance to list a property. And in many cases, that defaults to criterion C, which is the physical characteristics or architecture of the property. So just as nominations are not set in stone, nor are properties frozen in time when they're listed, things change, properties change. It's always a good idea to revisit older nominations for any number of reasons. Uh, from alterations to the, the physical qualities of the resource to adding new stories, new criteria, new um, areas of significance. Slide, please. A nomination is an argument that a property is worthy for preservation. It is not and has never been a complete history of a property. So um, often nominations take the path of least resistance. That path is often criterion C, which reinforces or enhances the perception that architecture and architectural integrity are favored in the National Register. This is a, a, a misperception that is drawn out by the fact that most of our listings are under criterion C, and it's because criterion C is often the easiest um, of the criteria to justify. So this has led to a skewed perception of how people evaluate the resources. This perception is supported by, oftentimes by section 106, the federal environmental review process, and sometimes even by how the National Register or what is being taught 
in uh, schools to uh, upcoming professionals. So if you look at this picture, the, the Buck Creek Rosenwald School in Kentucky, this is an example of a, of a, a property who lacks quite a bit of the historic design integrity of a Rosenwald school, but was still accepted and listed because the argument for significance and the explanation of how it can still reflect its importance and use as a Rosenwald school was made in the documentation, documentation that was prepared by a 14-year-old Girl Scout. Uh, slide, please. So there are myriad reasons for why any property is nominated to the National Register. <clears throat> Federal agencies are required to identify and nominate properties under their jurisdiction, for example. The Historic Preservation Fund, which uh, the federal government uses to help fund state historic preservation offices and their programs, has specific grant programs ranging from uh, funding for the SHPOs, the State Historic Preservation Offices, and Tribal Historic Preservation Offices to do surveys and nominations to specific funds for specific property types, such as the African American Civil Rights Grants or Underrepresented Communities Grants, both of which require either new nominations for the grant recipients or for older nominations to be amended utilizing that funding. Sometimes nominations are done as the result of federal environmental review and compliance. Sometimes potential tax credit projects will result in individual property nominations or even new historic districts. Sometimes it's just property owner who wants their property recognized. So the who and why, who writes the nomination and why it's done can color the content of the argument for listing. Since a property need only meet one of the four National Register criteria to be listed, and in crafting that argument, some potentially important information may be left out. But the good news is that those stories, those other areas of significance, can be added later through this amendment process. Slide, please. Another misunderstood part of property evaluations is the concept of historic integrity. Integrity and significance are intertwined. One cannot assess integrity until one examines the significance of the resource. As many of us are aware, we see this done backwards all the time. An initial assessment is based on the integrity of the resource, which is inherently biased to criterion C and architecture. So reconnaissance surveys, windshield surveys, surveys done by persons without right training or skill can all lead to a bias based on perceived integrity. How it should work, all aspects of significance are examined and then integrity is evaluated based on the identified significance. Slide. So just a reminder, there are seven aspects of historic integrity location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. But a property need not have all seven aspects. How the seven aspects are weighted in evaluations depends on the significance of the property. Slide. So the, the, the seven aspects and, and how they're weighed are colored by the criterion or criteria under which any property is evaluated. How we assess criterion A and B can vary greatly from C. Criterion A is uh, events, as we say. Criterion B is association with persons. Criterion C are the physical qualities of a, a, a property. And criterion D is archaeology. So how we assess A and B can vary diff greatly from criterion C. And how we look at D may be completely foreign to those who look at criteria A, B, and C. So criteria A and B are associative criteria. That is, there must be a direct and significant association between the property and the event or person. This places a premium on integrity of location, of association, of setting, and of feeling. 
Design is a little less important depending on the nature of the resource. Materials and workmanship can also be of lesser importance. It is where the thing happened or where the person achieved their significance that drives the, these criteria and thus how you evaluate those resources. Under Criterion C, we're looking primary, primarily at the physical qualities. So design and workmanship and materials are of paramount importance. Setting is very important and perhaps, perhaps even more so than location. Uh, we have listed any number of properties under Criterion C that have been moved from their original location. Feeling is important and relates to setting and design and association may be even of less importance. And under Criterion D, location is everything, location and association. Setting is negligible uh, and some of the others don't really apply. So uh, at an archeological site that is buried under an asphalt parking lot can still have a high degree of integrity, even if you can't physically see it. Slide, please. Other changes to nominations that go beyond additional documentation include boundary changes and removals. And this is, these are part of the expanding and maintaining the National Register. So here we have a, a, a small picture of Southern University Historic District. Uh, Southern is a historic black college or university, an HBCU. And the boundary increase more than tripled the area of the district and recognized not only the growth and continued importance of the district, but also included portions of the university grounds that add to the cultural significance of the place not just its educational importance. And in fact, the original nomination for Southern was really focused more on the architecture of the buildings than it was on the purpose of the campus. So maintaining the National Register also re means removing properties that no longer reflect their historic significance. Properties burn, properties are torn down. And since the National Register is a federal planning tool, Removing them from the National Register can be necessary as part of environmental review, but the record of the property remains. So there is a, a permanent repository for these National Register nominations uh, at the Park Service and within the uh, National Archives. And that includes those properties that have been removed from the National Register for whatever reason uh, necessitated their removal. So we still maintain those records uh, for all the properties listed. Um, slide please. So that gives you an overview of the how and why and what uh, from the federal perspective. So I'm going to turn it over to a couple of my colleagues. First, Lena McDonald will show you what some of the work is being done in Virginia. Greg Smith will talk about things happening in Texas. But before we go, I urge you to look at our guidance. Many of your questions can be answered simply by reviewing our publications. At the end, after Greg is done, we're going to open the floor to the Q&A uh, and try to answer as many of the questions that we can. We're not going to get into, into specifics about specific properties uh, we can't do that in a forum such as this, but we will try to answer as many questions about the, the process, where to start, uh, what to, to put into nominations in a general sense, and anything that we can, we can answer without getting into absolute specifics. So uh, right now I'm going to turn it over to Lena to talk a little bit about Virginia. And I remembered to unmute myself. I'm very, I'm very happy about that. Um, I also, uh, my name is Lena McDonald and I have been at the Department of Historic Resources in Virginia for uh, 10 years. Um, at the end of the month, it'll be 10 whole years. Prior to that, I worked as a consultant for almost uh, 15 years and I was really fortunate to work on projects in all over the country. 
um, some of which were so, so amazing. I can't believe I got paid to do some of them. Um, and Greg Smith and I actually met on one of those projects uh, that had to do with the El Camino Real. Um, and I, that continues to be one of my favorite projects too. Um, next slide. At Virginia though, at the SHPO, um, we have a very busy register program. And um, in addition to having a lot of new nominations, we do have a lot of uh, requests for uh, updating nominations too. And I'm gonna run through uh, a very wide assortment of updates that we've had in the past eight years or so. Um, I'm gonna start with the easy ones and then move into the more complex ones. Um, as you can see from the list though, the easy ones uh, include uh, if you have discovered a professional error in an original nomination, for example, if the wrong architect was identified for a property and uh, a person feels strongly that it should be corrected, we will process a, a, a correction like that. Um, from time to time, property owners want to uh, add a new property name. Um, Often this is for commercial properties um, because, for instance, we had a, a, a dwelling, a historic dwelling that was renovated to become a museum, and so they wanted to add the museum name to the cover sheet. Um, there are also technical updates uh, like the ones that Jim alluded to where you may not have a count of contributing and non-contributing resources or you have uh, additional information to add to the description or the statement of significance. And, and by that, I mean, you're not adding a new uh, area of significance necessarily or changing the period of significance. You're just adding to what's already in the nomination as it stands. Um, same thing goes with uh, period of significance. Anybody who's looked at the earliest nominations from the 60s and 70s will know that uh, the period of significance usually is very broadly defined and is not always helpful uh, for, for researchers now. Um, and then we consult with federal agencies when nominations are updated and uh, we consult with local governments and uh, property owners who want to improve their preservation planning uh, by having a, a more uh, up uh, up-to-date nomination. And then sometimes there are field investigations that take place after a property is listed that demonstrate that what was stated in the original nomination is not entirely accurate. So next slide, please. Um, each of the slides I'm gonna show has is gonna look very similar. Uh, I've got the um, image of the continuation sheet that we use for any additional documentation for a nomination. We always start off with an introduction um, because we want to lay out when was the property originally listed and what is the purpose of this new information. So for instance, with Marion's Historic District in Smith County, um, it was listed in 2000 and its boundary increased in 2011. And then there were corrections made to the inventory and sketch map in 2017. These were professional errors. And so it was not necessary to go through the process that you do with a new historic district nomination with property owner consultation and public meetings and uh, consultation with local officials. Um, in this case, the additional information was submitted for uh, historic tax credit applications. And it also, of course, is helpful for preservation planning at the local level. Each one of these slides has uh, the link to where DHR posts our nominations. If you want to see those, um, I'll be happy to uh, email anyone if they, or if anyone emails me and says, I'd really like to see an example of that nomination update you showed, I'd be happy to uh, help you out with that. Um, next slide. All right, so here's an example of this beautiful building where uh, we were asked to put a new name on the cover sheet. So, and that's the only thing that was uh, requested to be updated. And so dutifully, we added the proposed new name. Um, can't see past the, there's a thing in the way. Um, it's the Southern Virginia University Main Hall, I think is the new, is the new name. Um, and at the time of listing, the school was known as Southern Seminary. So, uh, and the reason that the cover sheet was updated is because the uh, college contacted us and said that people could not find 
uh, directions to their building through uh, things like Google Maps because um, they didn't they didn't know to look for it under a name the current name as opposed to the one that's on the nomination. Um, next slide, please. Um, sometimes uh, and usually again this is facilitating um, historic tax credit applications. Um, sometimes you want to uh, have a, a, a more current and detailed description of the property and, a, and an inventory that lists out contributing and non-contributing resources. Um, in classifying resources as contributing and non-contributing wasn't even required in the register program until after the uh, regs were revised, the National Register regulations were revised in the early 1980s. So this church in, in uh, Norfolk was listed in 1979. And in order to uh, facilitate some work on the property, the, the church hired a consultant who, um, one, who was asked to record the various changes that had occurred, had occurred to the property. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, was that at the time of listing, it was called St. Mary's Church, but then it was uh, uh, classified by, by the church as a, as a basilica. Um, I think it may be, one of Virginia's few basilicas in the, in the whole state. Um, they also wanted to clarify the period of significance for the, for the property. So they've done that as well. All right, next slide, please. Um, there, I had to change a setting quickly. For the almshouse in Richmond, um, that property also needed to have some corrections, not only because there was a little bit of conflicting information between uh, a 1981 nomination and a 1989 update, there also uh, was a desire to uh, get a current inventory and extend the period of significance. Um, this was again for historic tax credits and also for uh, management of a conservation easement on the property. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so for Jackson Ward Historic District, this is one of Virginia's most important historic districts. Um, it's a national historic landmark. And it's associated with uh, the African-American community in Richmond, Virginia, which is the state capital. Um, in this case, we, the SHPO, decided that it would be of great assistance to, to people who are doing various types of preservation projects in Jackson Moore to have a specific end date to the period of significance to work with. And so uh, what we did was our staff reviewed the original nomination for, uh, which was in 1976. We also looked at the NHL nomination from 1978. And based only on the information that was within the nominations, we established an end date to the period of significance um, that was related to when a major highway project went through the neighborhood and bifurcated, uh, essentially bifurcated it. And if you guys have worked with uh, historic African-American neighborhoods um, very much, you know that often there are highways that go right through them. Um, that was something done in the 50s and 60s and 70s um, when uh, transportation planners just sort of plowed through areas without necessarily uh, looking hard at the his, at the cultural fabric that they were they were paving. <laughs> Um, so all we did, this is a very simple nomination update. I think it's a page, um, is say that because the turnpike was completed in 1958, we felt that the period of significance should end in 1958. Um, we acknowledge though, this historic district has never been fully surveyed and, um, there are additional, uh, significant persons who should be noted in the historic district. There are uh, significant events that are, 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 are not discussed in detail. So this district is on our wish list for eventually doing a more comprehensive update. And I'll talk about that kind of project in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So uh, federally owned properties, as Jim mentioned already, the uh, federal, federal agencies are required by the NHPA 
to nominate their historic properties to the register. They also um, are required to uh, maintain a uh, sort of a current inventory of all of their uh, historic resources that they're managing. And so what that has meant here in Virginia is that the National Park Service has undertaken a massive effort for almost 10 years now to create very detailed uh, nominations for properties that were listed in the 1960s and 70s. Um, when this nomination came through, in this case, it was for a historic district that included both privately owned properties, mostly a residential neighborhood, but also a unit of the Petersburg National Battlefield. And so we sent the nomination update to the staff at the battlefield because often they are so steeped in the history of the unit that they can provide excellent uh, uh, review and clarification on, on events. And especially with the military history, I'm not a military historian, so that's that's great to have that level of uh, cooperation between us and the and the federal agency. Next slide. Also, uh, another uh, type of property owner that often is interested in knowing what they have and what they should be doing with it are colleges and universities. So Hampton Sydney College uh, was originally listed in 1970 very uh, basic nomination, as I'm sure you uh, would anticipate. Um, so the nomination update added the information that's often missing in, in early nominations. It sets a period of significance. It provides a comprehensive inventory and count of contributing and non-contributing resources. And it significantly expanded the statement of significance. Um, here we have an example where the property was listed in the midst of major social and cultural change, and the nomination doesn't really discuss it because at the time that was current events, it wasn't a historic one. Um, but 50 years later, uh, the uh, college's association with civil rights events in the county um, in the 1960s could be added and uh, placed in the historic context uh, and within the period of significance for the campus. Um, next slide. Another example where a uh, nomination update can be done without necessarily uh, doing a top to bottom renovation of the entire nomination is Chandler Court in Pollard Park here in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, it was listed in 1996, so it had a decent nomination already. But the uh, neighborhood's landscape design had been overlooked in the original nomination. Um, therefore, the update was designed was intended to add landscape architecture as an area of significance under Criterion C. And also because this is a mid 20th century neighborhood that wasn't fully built out until the 1960s, um, there was an opportunity to extend the period of significance to end in the late 1960s, which allowed the entire neighborhood to be uh, evaluated with contributing and non-contributing resources. And, and so nothing that should have been contributing, but because of the reliance on the 50 year uh, cutoff uh, had not been classified as contributing at the time of the original listing. So and certainly this is helpful for preservation planning for Williamsburg, um, which is a certified local government. Next slide. All right, and then um, every once in a while, a nomination gets through our SHPO's review and uh, Everything is based on what is known at the time of the nomination. And then sometimes uh, there's an opportunity after the nomination for very detailed and in-depth field investigations, which is what happened with Cedar Lane and New Kent County. Um, it was only listed in 2017, but um, it had a very complex uh, history, which we knew at the time of the nomination, original nomination. And then the owner, the current owner decided they wanted to do a uh, historic tax credit rehabilitation. And that included removing um, some materials to see what was underneath and poking around in attics and, and crawl spaces and basements to see 
more about the property's um, construction history. And um, our one of our state review board members, Carl Lounsbury, who is one of the most uh, uh, well-known architectural historians for Virginia, he led the investigations. And so he wrote a report that explained some, how some of the uh, construction and alteration history in the original nomination was erroneous and that and then explained you know what his findings were um again this is just considered to be a correction of professional error it's not meant to be um punitive in any way you just you know sometimes you find out something you had no idea when, when after a property gets listed um next slide okay so the next set of examples are going to be for really, really intensive updates that involved a lot of time, not a, a pretty considerable amount of money in some cases, uh, staff review and so on. Um, if you have a historic district uh, that was listed in 1972 and it has never been, the nomination has never been updated, then almost certainly you don't have an inventory of that district. You don't have a list of contributing and non-contributing resources. You probably don't even have a very good description uh, of, of what the district looks like. Um, you, again, too, you may not have start and end dates for a period of significance. You may not have a good understanding of the register eligibility criteria and areas of significance. And maybe you don't even know what level of significance would have been a, would have been appropriate for the district at the time of listing. Um, also, uh, some SHPOs, DHR uh, included, if we have a nationally significant property that was listed a long time ago, we would love to update it. Um, sometimes we can't um, because again, it can be very expensive. But um, just as an example of one of the properties <laughs> we would love to update sometime. The nomination for Mount Vernon, uh, George Washington's home, um, the statement of significance is not even one full sentence. It's a sentence fragment that says, home of George Washington, commander in chief of Patriot forces during the revolution and outstanding statement, statesman serving as first president of the United States. Um, <laughs> That, that does cover you know, the essentials, but there is so much more that, that would be warranted to include in a nomination for a property like that. And, and that includes um, adding information concerning underrepresented communities. Uh, Virginia is among the Southern states that have uh, many dozens or scores of uh, former plantations where enslaved African Americans uh, are known to have worked for generations. And the vast majority of the listed former plantations have older nominations and they make no mention of that aspect of the property's history. So uh, opportunities to update nominations like that to include um, a more diverse history are, is always a welcome opportunity. Next slide. Um, the Lexington Historic District in uh, Lexington, Virginia, it was listed in 1972. It had a fairly uh, minimal uh, nomination for the period. And the city of Lexington is a certified local government. They applied for a grant through the, our, our CLG program to up, resurvey and update the nomination. And so, um, it's a, it's a large historic district offhand. I can't remember how many properties are in it, but it's a couple hundred, I think. And so uh, the resource counts in section five of the current form, the historic functions were updated, the description of the district and the inventory. We did add a new area of significance, um, which allowed us to meet the uh, underrepresented communities um, goals that we have. Um, also, just, you know, bibliographic sources uh, are always helpful to include in a nomination for future researchers. And um, we had, we created a current sketch map, and we did not change the historic boundaries of this district. It's important to note that if you are changing the historic boundaries, as well as updating a nomination, that is not, this, that is a separate action than just submitting additional documentation. Boundary changes, are 
are considered new nominations. They're handled that way by the SHPO and by the National Park Service. So we could still have updated Lexington Historic District and changed its boundaries, but it would not have been submitted on continuation sheets like, like this one was. It would have been on a new nomination form and uh, the rationale for a change to the historic boundaries would have had to been justified and things like that. So uh, certainly when you have historic districts, um, in addition to pre preservation planning and historic tax credits and easement donations, um, environmental review is uh, facilitated by having uh, up-to-date nominations because the, the people involved in, in the project, whether it's a road project, an airport, uh, infrastructure like water lines or uh, electrical transmission quarters or what have you, uh, when they have a, when those folks have a, a current or more current nomination to work with, that just facilitates their work um, for identifying historic resources that may be affected by their project. Next slide. Um, Virginia has a uh, state stewardship program that uh, we. It's essentially similar to the national, the federal government's program where state agencies that own historic properties are encouraged to nominate them and to keep uh, the nominations current, you know, by updating maybe every 10 or 20 years. So the Scott House was listed in 2007 and it's considered to be an architectural masterpiece for us here in Richmond. Um, and the Virginia Commonwealth University owns the property. And so uh, they decided to do rehabilitation work and they invited a DHR architectural historian to be on site so that he could examine the materials that were being discovered and, uh, and have a better understanding of, of the building's history. Um, he then wrote the nomination update um, to include a uh, much more thorough description, even than the one from 2007. And then he also found information to add a new eligibility criterion, uh, criterion B for one of the prop two of the property owners, and also um, uh, areas of significance. So um, he added uh, commerce as an area of significance for one of the significant individuals. So uh, you never know what you're going to find with, with things like this. So um, if your state has a law or, or a program that encourages preservation of state properties, then um, this can be a great way to uh, help. Having nomina uh, nomination updates can be a great way to help with their preservation. Next slide. Uh, going back to the National Park Service and our partnership with them, um, we have a lot of battlefields here in Virginia, uh, Revolutionary War, uh, War of 1812 and Civil War. And uh, the National Park Service owns quite a few of them. Uh, they're generally nationally significant, like uh, Fred Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County battlefields. Um, often these kinds of resources were administratively listed in the National Register and it would be at least a decade for a lot of them before uh, nomination documentation was prepared. Uh, and then often if those were done in the 60s and 70s, then it's pretty minimal information. So the Park Service has been uh, going back to these kinds of uh, properties and doing a very, very detailed and thorough uh, nomination update. It's not been unusual for these these nationally significant battlefields to have a 200 or 300 page uh, additional documentation. Um, and it's it's a really impressive effort um, that I think will be of benefit for the parks for many, many years to come. Um, it also is an opportunity for DHR to work with the national parks and, and, and imp improve our understanding of what is in these federally owned um, locations. Next slide. Um, we do, and then nationally significant properties, as I mentioned earlier, um, we would love to get updated information for all of our properties that are nationally significant. And they're not all just beautiful buildings. Um, they often have many layers of, of significance. And Tuckahoe is an example. It was listed in the registers in 68 and designated in NHL in 1969. And 
going back that far back, uh, it was not a very detailed nomination. Um, so our staff undertook the first comprehensive survey of resources and created an inventory of contributing and non-contributing re resources for the first time. And then we did a lot of research to expand and justify the period and areas of significance. Um, it, and the interest, one of the interesting things about this uh, property is that um, it was involved in one of the first major lawsuits uh, concerning the National Register and the National Historic Preservation Act and the environmental review process um, for findings of adverse effects. And um, it's in the preservation case law uh, compilation that ACE is, I can't remember offhand if National Trust puts that out or if it's the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. But we wanted to include all of that information in the um, updated nomination and extend the period of significance to include the settlement of that lawsuit because it has been so important to uh, how environmental review projects have been handled in Virginia ever since. Um, so you never know. Sometimes you're going to find an area of significance that that you know you you don't necessarily think, oh, that's that's a that's totally going to be there. You know, uh, sometimes you, sometimes it's an unexpected layer. Um, another important thing with nominations that I haven't uh, mentioned much yet is the mapping. Um, often. Uh, as Jim alluded to, the early nominations have, have very basic mapping. Um, usually there is just a uh, topographic map section that is included with the nomination that has a circle drawn around the listed property. Um, so sketch maps and photo keys were never, uh, I don't think, considered uh, for inclusion in nominations originally. But of course, now that's a standard aspect of maps. So uh, we did create maps um, to current standard, including one that sh shows the historic boundaries uh, and uh, one that shows all the contributing and non-contributing resources and another one that shows uh, where the photos were taken. Because this is a large property. I think it's, it's, I know it's more than a hundred acres. I can't remember offhand how big it is, but it's, it's substantial. And it's been occupied since the colonial period. So it has a lot of, of stuff, uh, both above ground and below ground that needed to be inventoried. Next slide. Uh, St. Luke building in Richmond is another one that needed to be updated. Um, this one it was updated to facilitate a historic tax credit project. So the building was listed in 1981 at the statewide level of significance because it housed uh, a, a bank that was very significant in Virginia history because it was a, the bank was established by an African American woman and it was intended to serve African American customers um, during the Jim Crow era. So um, the nomination update provided a more detailed architectural description, including a description of the specific activities that happened in the building uh, on certain floors, um, such as. The first floor is where the bank was located. Another floor had a printing press for a, a, an associated um, organization that uh, Maggie Walker uh, founded. Uh, Maggie Walker is a very significant person in Virginia history. Um, so all the... <laughs> I don't know why in 1981, when the building was originally listed, that Criterion B wasn't used, but it wasn't. Um, so we added Criterion B to this one for Maggie Walker's contributions in the areas of commerce and ethnic heritage. Um, she is a nationally significant figure. Um, there is actually a national historic site, the Maggie L. Walker NHS in Richmond, that's a couple of blocks away from this building. Um, the NHS has her, her home um, and uh, interprets her life and her career, or her personal life and career. And then this, this, the St. Luke building is a privately owned property that is not, I think it's apartments now. So it's not as interpreted the way the NHS is. But we wanted the nomination to be uh, 
uh, updated to current standards to include her career, despite that the NHS also uh, documents that. And we did send this, this nomination update to the park staff at the National Historic Site, and they provided review and comments and, and suggestions that were super helpful. So uh, that is that for the St. Luke building. Next slide. Uh, Malvern Hill is another Civil War associated property. It's in private ownership, but uh, the organizations that own it are, are planning to convey the ownership to the National Park Service for inclusion in the Richmond National Battlefield Park. So having a nomination update uh, was part of this, this very large effort to um, facilitate that, that change in ownership. Um, it was listed in 1969 at the state level of significance, primarily because the dwelling on the property was uh, extremely uh, rare example of a 17th century house. Um, and even though it was destroyed by fire in 1905, it was still, uh, we still, the, it, the property was still listed under cri criterion C as well as for its military history. Um, the additional documentation was done in 2020, and we did our we did the very first comprehensive survey of architectural resources and an inventory, and then we did additional research that expanded and justified the period of significance, levels of significance, new criteria and areas of significance. Um, the battlefield's level of significance was changed to national uh, because of the its association with um, how the Civil War. Uh, I think it was the Peninsula Campaign uh, took shape. And again, um, I relied on not just National Park Service staff, but also a retired historian who used to work at DHR, who's a military history. I relied on them to make sure that all the military history was correct, because um, I'm not uh, qualified to do that. Um, and then the other thing we did was create maps, because the Historic boundary, uh, as it was shown in 1969, uh, was pretty vague. And we, and in order to facilitate the property transfer, we really needed to have more current maps um, that were more detailed. Um, so if you have a organization that is doing conservation easements or battlefield lands acquisitions or something else where maybe private nonprofits uh, like the Nature Conservancy and um, land tr various land trusts are working. And there is a potential for either a state or federally owned property to be included, then um, nomination updates can really facilitate uh, how those kinds of projects can proceed um, by providing a, a sort of a roadmap of, of what you're trying, what you know is there what you want to preserve, um, how you can also incorporate other goals. Like if you wanna do, if it's the Nature Conservancy, they may want to restore some wetlands or uh, create a, a native plants um, area and remove invasive species and things like that. Um, and and it, a nomination can help with, uh, can help with that even though we're not, the register program isn't necessarily about uh, dealing with native or invasive plants. Next slide. Um, then we have opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, to include underrepresented communities. Uh, my favorite example recently for this is the Lawrenceville Historic District in Brunswick County. This district was listed in 2000. And um, for some context, the Commonwealth of Virginia introduced a state historic tax credit in 1998 or 99. Um, and it led to an explosion of interest in historic district nominations in order to facilitate rehabilitations. And so when Lawrenceville's historic district was listed in 2000, it, uh, it was not necessarily intended as a comprehensive history of the, of the whole town or to cover you know, all of the applicable areas of significance. Um, that it, was, it was intended to get, this, get the district listed um, and move on with other things. But um, last year, uh, 
there was a, again a, a, a grant funded project this time it was through the state cost share program which is a, a program where the dhr uh, contracts with a local government and we hire a consultant and figure out a project uh, for for preservation purposes and so the town of Lawrenceville wanted to update their nomination to include more accurate and up-to-date inventory resource counts but they also wanted to 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 focus more on one of the aspects of the town's significance that was barely wasn't touched on as much in the original nomination, and that was St. Paul's College, which was a historic uh, African American school. And there were two individuals in particular who were identified during the research who were warranted inclusion in the nomination under criterion B for their contributions. So we had an opportunity to get um, this historic district updated, not only for preservation planning and historic tax credit purposes and that, and that sort of thing, but also to uh, flesh out uh, an important aspect of the town's history. Next slide. Um, similarly, Farmville Historic District in Prince Edward County. Uh, this is a nomination from the late 1980s. Um, Farmville was the site of some intense uh, civil rights activity during the 1950s and 60s. Um, Prince Edward County is famous uh, at least among history nerds, for having closed its public schools for five years rather than allow integration of their schools. And so um, when the historic district was originally listed in 1989, um, the events of the civil rights movement were still less, quite a lot less than 50 years ago. And at the time of the nomination, it was decided to uh, focus on on the earlier history and not not try to use cri the criteria consideration for properties that have achieved significance within the more recent past. Um, so uh, the period of significance used the uh, traditional 50 year end date, which is not something we do a lot anymore for the ending the period of significance. Um, so it was listed in 1989 and the end date to the period of significance originally was 1930s. So with the nomination update, we expanded the period of significance to a hard end date in the 1960s so that we could take into account the civil rights events and the historic significant person, uh, the Reverend L. Francis Griffin, who played a major role in um, the local civil rights movement. Um, also, there were resources that went from being contrib non-contributing to contributing just based on their construction date, their integrity, their association with, with the historic context in the, in the district. Um, that's one of, the, one of the aspects of doing a, a really comprehensive district update is that you are, especially if you change your period of significance, you often are going to have buildings that flip from non-contributing to, to contributing. Uh, and same goes with sites and objects and structures too. Um, so that's something to take into account uh, when you're planning a uh, nomination update for a district. Next slide. Um, Kentland Farm Historic and Archeological District in Prince Edward County is the only, only nomination update I could find and I, I admit I did not have a huge amount of time to do the research, but I found uh, what interested me about this nomination is that it added an archae archaeological sites that were significant. Um, and it focused on a slave cemetery, which um, if you if you followed news in Virginia in the past few years, um, the slave cemeteries are very uh, hot topic right now in terms of uh, better understanding of their significance. Um, so this, this particular nomination update from 2006 was a bit of a, of a it was kind of on the cutting edge at the time. Um, so the updated analysis of the site significance and information potential added to the significance of the property under criterion D. And there also was an oral history project with descendants of enslaved persons, which is something that a lot of major properties here in Virginia, like Mount Vernon, Montpelier, uh, Monticello, 
uh, other other properties like that have started doing in the past five to ten years, um, and and those are incredibly valuable sources of information. So. Uh, I would recommend not overlooking that if you are considering a nomination update for a property um, that has underrepresented communities who are probably not well represented in the historic record, uh, but there still is a very strong oral history to tradition that can provide a lot of information. Next slide. Okay. And um, sometimes you can update a nomination um, that was recent, like for instance, the Meadow Historic District was listed in 2015. And the nomination update was primarily just to add interview excerpts and personal rec recollections of African-American grooms and trainers who had worked with Secretariat, who is the Triple Crown winner from the early 1970s. Um, I think 1973 is when, when the, he was the Triple Crown winner. So even though the original nomination acknowledged that African-Americans um, had been important in the training crew for the, for the racehorses at the Meadow, uh, a later researcher actually was able to track down some of these, some of these gentlemen who are still alive. They're, they're getting up in years. And she uh, did some interviews and uh, also found uh, some publications uh, of interviews with people who have since passed. And so she wanted to add all of that to the nomination. So we did that uh, in order to uh, have a fuller story about the Meadow uh, in its nomination. Next slide. Okay, I thought that was the last one. I, uh, that's all from me and I'm happy to pass the torch over to Greg now. Okay, thank you very much. I will follow up with on a lot of what uh, Jim and Lena have discussed, uh, showing you more examples of uh, nomination amendments that we've done in Texas. Uh, and then I'm going to show you examples uh, that reflect our current strategies and documentation standards, especially pertaining to underrepresented communities. And then finally, uh, discuss some approaches to amending nominations to um, to better reflect uh, the, the broad communities that we have here in Texas. Uh, next. So as Jim mentioned, uh, the, the, the guidelines for uh, amending the National Register nominations form are, are in the red bulletin, how to complete the National Register nomination form. Um, it's they only cover a couple pages and it's more or less a, a list of the sorts of things um, that you can uh, 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 that you can amend a nomination for next please. So this is this is just a, a, essentially a copy and paste uh, from the bulletin and these are all things that have been covered already and so we can move on to the next slide. All right, so I'm going to show you some examples of some of some recent um, nomination amendments. I should probably add, um, I have been the National Register Coordinator in Texas for 22 years. And so in my time, we've processed over 800 nominations. Um, I should also add that uh, the vast majority of the nominations in Texas are coming from outside our agency. And so uh, it, it's 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 rare uh, that we will initiate a nomination at the SHPO. Uh, that said, um, we have a pretty good uh, level of diversity in the applications that we're seeing today, uh, due to a number of of, of factors. Um, but for those of you you know who have been concerned about uh, how the National Register reflects American history, I often say. You know, look at it as an anthology with the first chapters written in the 1960s. What would you expect from uh, from histories written in the 1960s? Um, skip forward to the later chapters, and you'll see a very different way of of telling these these stories. Um, and of course, with the nomination process, we can go back to those first chapters and do uh, some editing or even an entire rewrite. So I'm going to show you some examples 
Uh, this is for the main and military plazas historic district. Uh, this was a period of significance and a boundary increase. What I always like to do is have a statement of purpose at the beginning of all the amendments that lay out exactly what we're trying to do with that amendment. Um, it lays out the scope and some of our strategies on, and, on what we're gonna be doing. And then it sets the expectation for the reviewer and the various readers who are gonna be looking at these documentations. So here's just one example where we looked at a nomination from 1979. And uh, one of our goals was to extend the period of significance, but also add um, some areas to the, to the boundary. And as been mentioned before, um, once you start changing boundaries, whether adding to them or decreasing them, um, it requires review by the state board. It requires notifications of those owners in the affected areas. And so it is treated like a new nomination um, for those new areas or the areas where the boundary change has occurred, um, but, the, um, but, but not necessarily for the already listed um, portions of the historic district. Next. So with the main and military plazas historic district, what we did was add two, two city blocks. Uh, our general strategy is to, uh, uh, whenever possible, make a site visit and, and walk through the district. Um, we like to account for the contributing and non-contributing status of all the properties uh, within the listed area, but then walk around the, the, um, around the periphery and see what could be added. Um, even though we have Google Street View, there's really nothing beats actually being on the ground. So we do, we do that uh, whenever possible. Uh, next, please. Um, when you look at old nominations, you'll see uh, different terminology. So uh, you won't necessarily see contributing and non-contributing. And when we do nominations today, uh, a property is, is either contributing or non-contributing. Back in the day in the 1970s, uh, you'll also see the terms intrusive, um, and compatible. And so one of the uh, things that we try to accomplish when we're uh, revising an, uh, the nomination for a historic district is, uh, is make a new assessment of all the properties within, um, within that, that area. Um, most of the intrusives or a lot of them are, are gonna be non-contributing, but not all of them because many of them were intrusive uh, because they were not historic at that time. And then um, we'll often see most of the compatibles uh, with the passage of time and the extension of the period of significance will now become contributing. In, in this case, that intrusive building, the Frost Tower, which was designed in, and they started its construction in 1973, that is now a contributing building within this historic district. Uh, when it comes to historic districts, there is some latitude for extending the period of significance beyond that 50 year point, uh, you have to give a good reason. Uh, it can't be by a matter of decades, uh, certainly without claiming uh, exceptional significance, but by a few years, it's possible. Uh, and so if, if uh, you're a member of the audience and you are not uh, part of the SHPO staff, uh, definitely look towards your SHPO staff. Uh, if you have any questions about how to apply some of these strategies and then SHPO staff, uh, of course, we have a good connection to the National Register staff in, at the Park Service. And so uh, we're, not flying, we're not flying blind here. Uh, we have uh, at the state level uh, a good connection to all the other National Register coordinators. We keep in touch with each other so we can learn from each other. And of course, we can always reach out to the National Park Service staff for some uh, in more, more informal guidance. Next, please. So here's another example. This is the Strand Historic District, uh, which, is, which became a National Historic Landmark in 1976. Um, but again, this is a 1970 nomination. And so there were lots of issues with it. And so um, partly due to tax credits um, and the inadequacy of the nomination, but also just so we had a working document that was more user friendly and, and up to date, um, we ended up doing a pretty extensive revision of this district. We did not increase the boundaries. 
but uh, we created a map where there had been no map and inventory where the, there had been no inventory. Um, the period of significance was limited to the 19th century. Uh, back then the form, you would essentially check the appropriate century. And so the period of significance here ended just before the, the great storm of 1900, which was a seminal event in the history of, of the city and county of Galveston. Next, please. Just wanted to show you an example of our updated map. Uh, and uh, as I said, we, we didn't change the boundaries. So the current boundary actually goes through um, a, a skyscraper, uh, number 89. Um, and we just noted that, that we weren't gonna change the boundary just so we could include or exclude portion of the skyscraper. Uh, so we, we were pretty strict with that. As I said, you know, we always have a statement of purpose at the beginning of each amendment. Uh, whenever possible, we'll go through this effort to, um, to when change a period of significance that will be applied to the entire district. We'll do a whole new survey. We'll create new maps, new photographs, and so forth. And we'll also lay out uh, registration requirements and. Um, identify representative properties like we would with any other district nomination. Uh, but as I said here, we did not, we, cho we chose here to not extend the boundary because uh, what we had to do was already um, a, a, a pretty extensive reworking of the old nomination. Next, please. So here are just a couple of the examples of the types of buildings um, that, that benefited from this boundary, this um, period of significance change. So the 1940 Galveston Cotton Exchange building, the 1929 um, skyscraper uh, medical arts building, uh, both of these were rehabilitated uh, following the uh, state and federal tax credit programs. Next. Um, here's another amendment uh, for the Stagecoach Inn. This is a, a antebellum stagecoach stop. Uh, and so uh, the, the object here was to increase the period of significance and the boundary. And you'll see why this was so important in the next slide, please. So originally the stagecoach in was um, nominated as part of a multiple property form. And the nomination for the stagecoach in was just a few pages long. Um, some nominations under old nominate, old um, multiple property forms um, might be only a page long, um, more or less akin to a, to a survey card with a photograph. Uh, here, we wanted to recognize the significance of the 1960s uh, expansion of what became the Stagecoach Inn. Uh, and so uh, we extended the period of significance. We extended the boundary um, quite, uh, quite decisively, and uh, we wanted to recognize the buildings and structures and landscapes uh, through 1966. Uh, when Stagecoach Inn was first listed, uh, the criteria weren't even identified, just areas of significance. And so we assumed those to be, or interpreted them to be reflective of criteria A and C. Next, please. So here are some of the, of the properties and landscapes that are now listed in the National Register. Uh, and the stagecoach in uh, the original antebellum building served as a, as a popular restaurant. And it's still part of this property, but we wanted to include the clubhouse building. Uh, there's a motel resort, a great sign um, that is a very visible landmark on uh, Interstate 35. Next, please. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we can decide what the scope of the uh, application is going to be when there's an amendment involved. Uh, and this is usually after a consultation with the applicant. So we have an understanding of, of what they want to do, what their main goal is. Uh, and then uh, we will help them decide, you know, whether a limited scope will, will work or whether they have to do something more extensive. And in this case, this was also uh, inspired by a proposed tax credit um, rehabilitation project, a boundary increase for the Blake and Hinkle Lumber Company in, in, in Paris, Texas. If you've seen the film Paris, Texas, you have not seen Paris, Texas because it was not filmed there. Uh, when they did this nomination in the 1970s, 
uh, there was a, a very strict adherence to including only whole blocks uh, within the boundary. That's something that we do not adhere to today. You'll see from some of the my other examples uh, that we will we, we will gerrymander a boundary as as necessary to include the highest concentration of related resources. In this case, uh, there was just one little building across the street from the boundary. Uh, we, we did do uh, a, a, a quick survey just to determine if there were any other properties on, on the periphery that would benefit from a boundary increase, at least in this portion of the district. And we had decided that, that there, was, there was not. Uh, and so this was, um, this building was built after the 1916 fire, which devastated the central business district of, of Paris. And this was all that was left of a, of a large lumber facility. Next, please. You can see from this photograph uh, that this lone building, which is now sitting all alone, uh, was one of the two, um, two brick buildings as part of this large uh, lumber operation. And uh, all of those other properties are gone. And so this was not likely the sort of building that would be listed um, individually today because it only reflected part of that large complex, but it's still very much representative of the sort of buildings that were being built after the 1916 fire. Uh, and so this shared a lot of characteristics with the other buildings in the commercial district um, designed by a local architect and, and, and so forth. And so it made sense to include it as a contributing building in the uh, historic district. For this, we did not do an extensive resurvey of the entire district, and we did not change the period of significance. We just wanted to extend the boundary for this particular one. And that was after co consultation with the applicant um, and getting an understanding of what they were willing and able to do at that time. Next, please. And here's the Beaumont Commercial Historic District. This is another district that was um, that was listed. Uh, I think it was 1983. And uh, these are black and white photographs from the nomination at that time. And you can see the sort of landmark, architecturally significant buildings that were included as contributing buildings at that time. Next, please. Uh, and so what we we did for this amendment was um, a new survey. And so we have evaluated uh, the contributing and non-contributing status of all the properties within the existing boundary. Uh, and we proposed an expansion to the period of significance to at least the 50 year point. We actually tried to go a little bit beyond the 50 year point, but our park service reviewer at that time um, did not think that was the right approach. Uh, and the, one of the other things we did as we walked around the district was identify other properties that would benefit from being uh, included within this, uh, this district. And for whatever reason, they were excluded. Um, some because they were not within the period of significance. Some were just a little bit too far um, from the core of the district. And at that time, um, the standards for uh, determining boundaries for historic districts were a little bit more conservative. Uh, and so the sorts of buildings that we included in the district included a, a post-war department store, uh, which is the top photo, the former Antioch Baptist Church, which is a historic black congregation in Beaumont, and then um, a commercial building that had been slip covered at the time of the nomination and excluded from the boundary. Uh, this was the first tax credit project I ever reviewed. Uh, they had already taken off the slip cover and pretty much revealed what you what you see there in the bottom photo. And so that was the impetus for this particular boundary increase. Uh, next. But one of the other things that happened in the course of, uh, of doing this work uh, was that we wanted to consider the significance of the 1963 First Security Bank, which was only about 40 40 some years old at the time of the amendment. And so um, since we weren't going to extend the period of significance all the way to 63 to include it, we made a case for individual significance of this building and added a period of significance just for this building. 
Um, and the documentation that supported that including, included a city plan that was published in the late 1950s that addressed perceived problems with downtown Beaumont, including lack of parking, um, garish signage, things like that. Um, and this building addressed um, many of those points, including uh, a, a good amount of the, the volume of this building is occupied by parking garage, uh, which was deemed uh, you know, very important uh, for downtown Be Beaumont uh, in the post-war period, what to do with all these cars that are coming downtown. And so they had this large parking lot, this really incredible um, building with three soleil, um, uh, and it, 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 fills half, it fills half a block. And it was also done by a, a noteworthy um, architectural firm uh, uh, hem, helmed by uh, Llewellyn Pitts, who died tragically just a few years later. Uh, next, please. And then this is the Dallas Downtown Historic District, which was listed in 2006. Uh, around the time of the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, we worked with nonprofit Preservation Dallas, who was interested in documenting all of the sites associated with the Kennedy assassination. Uh, Dealey Plaza had already been listed. It's all, it was already a National Historic Landmark. I had worked on the nomination of the Texas Theater where Lee Harvey Oswald was apprehended. And so uh, this effort was to find all the other potential uh, properties associated with this, the assassination, its planning, its aftermath. And, and this was one of them. It was already within the downtown historic district, which it's the municipal building, the oldest portion of which is 1913. And then the, the large addition, the modern addition from the 1950s. And, and this became the center of news activity after the Kennedy assassination, because this is where Lee Harvey Oswald was brought and interrogated and they invited uh, news, newspapers and, and television reporters from all over the world. Um, and there are photographs of this building with um, surrounded by uh, TV vans and all sorts of cables and wires going up the front of this building to, to cover the event. Um, and it's also, next please, in the basement, the location of where Lee Harvey Oswald was shot by, by Jack Ruby. And it's also the building where uh, the cell where Lee Harvey Oswald was, was detained was. And after Ruby shot Oswald, uh, guess where they put Jack Ruby? They put him in the same cell where Oswald had been. Um, I got, had the opportunity to visit this site a few years ago. And uh, that, is, that is the actual uh, location of where Oswald was shot. Uh, next, please. Okay. So when it comes to um, amending nominations to uh, address underrepresented communities, I first wanted to show you some of our current strategies for addressing this topic in new nominations. Um, and that includes um, the inclusivity in the nominated, in the properties nominated and inclusivity in the stories told. Next, please. So uh, obviously one of the, uh, one of the key strategies is to list those places that are directly associated with underrepresented communities, places like the Galvan Ballroom, which was listed at the state level under three criteria, uh, the least of which was the architecture. Uh, it was really about um, entertainment and commerce. This was a, a live music venue that was um, built by uh, Mr. Gal Galvan, who was a very prominent businessman. Uh, in part uh, because his children were musicians. Uh, they had taken on uh, a love for big band jazz and uh, uh, he did not want them to, uh, to leave Corpus Christi. So he built them their own ballroom and they played as a house band. As you can see in the photo, uh, this place attracted um, big, big names in music, including Duke Ellington, the Dorsey brothers. Next, please. Uh, and so we, the, I have uh, attended a lot of conferences and meetings and so forth where the question comes up about integrity and do the integrity standards make it difficult to nominate and list properties associated with under 
underrepresented communities. And so I wanted to show you examples where um, it's not necessarily the case. Now, each of these, um, they're all three in, in, in Texas. Um, each one has its own story. And so what we're always looking at is the balance of significance with the integrity. So as, as Jim mentioned, we look at the significance first and the more significant a property is, the greater le leniency may be given when it comes to the integrity. Next. So first, here's the Dr. James Dickey house. Um, Dr. Dickey was a physician in, in Taylor, Texas, which is a small city just north of Austin. And uh, he was a doctor with his own clinic, um, but his clinic is gone. That, that building is no longer extant. And so this was his house where he also um, uh, saw patients as, as well. And so uh, he was prominent, not just for being a doctor, but also a civil rights leader. He was a champion for things such as creation of a park in the city for African-American youth. He not only had African-American patients, but also Mexican-American patients, anybody who uh, did who would not be welcome at the local city hospital. And so he was a great humanitarian, um, even though his name is not well known outside of, outside of Taylor, outside of uh, Williamson County, he was a real uh, pillar of that community. And so this is what the house looked like when it was nominated. And on top of that, it had also been moved. Now it was moved, you'll see in the, the map there, only one block. And so that was a mitigating factor. It wasn't moved very far. It was moved to a very similar lot, but you can also tell it looked like it needed a lot of work and it, it truly did. And uh, I followed up on, on this just recently and I saw some photographs the way it looks now and it looks markedly improved. But this was deemed as having uh, sufficient integrity to be listed under criterion B for association with Dr. Dickey and also under criterion A in the area of ethnic heritage, uh, Af African-American. Next. So this is the, uh, the Knights of Pythias Lodge, the Grand Lodge of Colored Knights of Pythias, Texas, which is in uh, the Deep Ellum neighborhood of, of Dallas. It's a five-story building. It was built in 1916. Um, the architect was William Sidney Pittman, who was a, a, a noted African-American architect. Um, this building had been through a lot of changes. The cornice was gone. The storefronts were gone. Uh, the windows had been changed out. The whole thing was painted uh, a, a grayish color. Um, it served as a bank for some time. The entire interior was gutted. And so this came into us as a part one application for federal tax credits. Um, and it came down to um, a request for me to write down some bullet points of why this should be listed uh, despite this great loss of integrity. And the keeper at that time um, used, used my, my bullet points in addition to the documentation and said yes, uh, that this retains sufficient in, sufficient integrity. Um, it was a, a, a monumental building, um, the, the, the largest office building, mixed use building, um, designed, built, occupied, used, owned by African-Americans in the state of Texas. So this merited special consideration. Next, please. And then finally, uh, we haven't submitted this to the Park Service yet, but we've had some good discussions about it. This is Anderson Stadium. The nomination was prepared by uh, um, Rebecca DeBrasco in Austin uh, on behalf of the uh, alumni organization. Uh, Austin High was the African-American high school and this was their football stadium. The high school has undergone and it's undergoing uh, very dramatic changes. And so this is the last portion of the campus that still had integrity. Uh, it's it's uh, still in its uh, full for formation. Uh, now at one point, you'll see in the slide at, at the, um, the photo in the lower left, it was an asphalt parking lot. Um, and then it was, it was uh, reclaimed uh, as a football field um, with help from Hollywood Henderson. Uh, uh, the, the, Pro foot, former, former pro football player who um, gave funds to uh, 
to reestablish this as a, as a football field. The stands are gone. Um, there are new grandstands that were, were built. Um, they're not the capacity that the original stands were. Uh, but even those stands could not hold the up to 6,000 people that um, sometimes attended footballs, um, the football games here, also track meet, marching band. And so uh, there are other buildings surrounding it, uh, the, the ticket booth, uh, the field house, uh, and, and so forth, that still you know, gives you that feeling that you are you know, uh, experiencing being in a football field. And, uh, and so uh, after some consultation with staff at the park service, that was a strategy that we used going forward. Also, this is very important. There was another high school football stadium in Texas, a few miles away uh, that was used by every high school football team, except for the African-American school. Um, in many cities, most cities with segregated high schools and segregated football teams, the African-American school at least got to play um, in the municipal football stadium, um, perhaps on Thursday nights instead of Friday nights. That was not the case in Austin. And the African-American school had its own stadium only for African-American use, which made this field particularly unique statewide. Next. So, um, I'm going to I'm going to go through um, some other nominations that that we've done um, where we address um, uh, underrepresented communities in different ways. So this is the Childress Commercial and Civic Historic District. This is one of those rare nominations that we did initiate at the state level at the state level um, th through the SHPO office, uh, working with the Texas Main Street program. Uh, and so uh, Childress is in, uh, it's, it's at the southeast corner of the Texas Panhandle. And as you can see, it's got magnificent brick streets, a great collection of commercial buildings. Uh, we extended this boundary to include a uh, high school campus and also a park. Next, please. And so in the, in the map on this slide, uh, the, the lower portion of the district uh, is uh, perpendicular to the railroad tracks. The depot is unfortunately gone. That's the commercial area and also where the county courthouse and the, and the municipal building are. And then as you travel um, northeast uh, is, the, is the high school campus. And then finally at the very top, that largest area is the municipal park with a WPA a football stadium and baseball field, National Youth Administration work uh, throughout. In the course of doing the survey for this historic district, uh, we became aware of the Rhodes School, which was the African-American school. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting some of the alumni. They were interested in getting their campus also listed in the National Register. The school was gone. Uh, but the gymnasium, which was a significantly larger investment on the part of the district, uh, was still standing and was, had really great integrity, as, uh, as was that the original playground with the original playground equipment. This wasn't just the high school. This was the African-American school for all, all grades, whereas the, um, the campus within the contiguous boundary of the district uh, was a high school campus only. And as I said, it was a really magnificent campus. And so our strategy here was, well, what, what do we do? Uh, this school should be recognized. Um, and the scope of this nomination, our original intent was to be very comprehensive. And what do we do with this other school eight blocks away? And so my thought was, well, we could nominate it individually, but um, why not recognize um, se segregation, the reality of segregation and the separateness that was part of that um, within this nomination and, uh, and uh, do a discontiguous district um, uh, with the reason being that if not for segregation, there would not be this other campus and that is why it is separate. And so um, I ran it by our park service reviewer, Paul Signan, and um, and he agreed that that was a good approach. I don't know of any other um, district quite like this. Uh, if there are others, I'd be interested in, in, in knowing about it. 
um, or else I'll, I'll just keep saying that ours was the first um, until I'm shown otherwise. Next, please. Uh, we come up with some program uh, strat strategies uh, that apply to all of our nominations. A few years ago, we did a nomination for the Monte Verde Plantation um, in East Texas. And uh, through the course of doing that, um, one of our staff did a lot of research and came up with great documentation about all the enslaved peoples that, that lived there and worked there that literally built this place. And so we decided that obviously we'll have to apply criterion A, ethnic heritage, African-American. And then we decided at that point that anytime we do a nomination for a, a, a plantation in the future, we'll just add criterion A, ethnic heritage, African-American, because that place would not exist without the enslaved people who built it, worked it. And so that came our new office policy. Next. Um, we address segregation in new nominations, like this example, the Edna Theater. Uh, this came to us from the folks in Edna in Jackson County that were um, proud of this theater, which is a landmark in, in Edna with a gigantic mast with, a, with neon signage and the name of the theater. And uh, in the course of doing this, we asked, well, what a, how was segregation handled in this particular property? And uh, we discussed the second balcony that was uh, reserved only for African-American um, use, and then uh, a separate staircase that, that led from the exterior, where they had a very small concession stand at the door where African-American uh, attendees would, would get their popcorn and what have you, walk up this flight of stairs and sit in this section of the theater. And so that wasn't the main focus of the nomination, but it had to be included in there. So we, that's standard for us on new nominations for theaters, for any segregated, historically segregated uh, facility that was um, used and especially designed um, with segregation in mind. So courthouses, jails, depots, well-documented examples. Next, please. Um, and then the Pittsburgh Commercial Historic District, this was another project that we did with our Main Street program. And when I mentioned gerrymandered um, districts, you can see here um, the, uh, the, the, the district map, um, that odd shape, that really is reflective of the original layout and the planning and maybe perhaps lack of planning in this particular city in East Texas and also the way of the streets address the intersection of two railroad lines just on the west side. One of the things that was very interesting about this particular district, I don't know of any other examples in the state, was that the buildings ran from street to street. And so the backs of the buildings are not on alleys, they are on streets. And um, those were the historic African-American entrances for these businesses that lined the, 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 the main streets. Um, and this was consistent, this was well documented, and so we address that. Even though it's not something that you see necessarily, um, once you understand that history, um, then you can start um, recognizing some of the physical evidence of it. Next, please. And then this is a, a recent nomination as well. We've not submitted it yet to the Park Service where we address segregation. I also wanted to note that we're not just looking at African-American history, but also Latino history. Uh, we're working on nominations for uh, disability history. We've done nominations with focus on women's history. Uh, next, please. And then um, we also acknowledge systemic exclusion. And so uh, we do nominations for suburban subdivisions and so forth where uh, these were white spaces created you know, by and for white, the use of white people. And uh, we, we note that. And so the, um, there's an African-American story in all of these properties as well. And it's a basis of exclusion and how that was facilitated. Was it through deed restrictions? Uh, was it um, uh, through um, what's generally understood nationwide as um, discriminatory lending practices and governmental policies and laws and so forth 
that, uh, that perpetuated uh, segregation in, um, in, in housing. Next. Okay, and so I'll end with um, some of our approaches to amending nominations to include underrepresented communities. Uh, I wanted to show those examples of our approaches to new nominations because the whole idea of an amendment is to bring an old nomination up to current standards. So I wanted to show you what our current standards and approaches were. And so um, we, we're, we're working on some projects. Um, they're underway, but I wanted to touch upon some of them. Next, please. So where to begin? Uh, look around in the state where you are. Um, I, I would say um, easy pickings would be starting with the earliest nominations. Uh, those are going to be the ones that have the weakest documentation and are, are going to be more apt to ignore some of these stories. And so, if, for example, in Texas, our first listings, we had nine listings in 1969 on the same day. Six of those were in Marion County, where during the 19th century, um, before the Civil War, the enslaved population vastly outnumbered the non-enslaved pop population. And so there's a lot of opportunity to examine African-American history uh, in, in, in that city that would have been barely mentioned in most of these nominations. And the other three nominations listed on that first day were in Galveston, um, which had the largest uh, slave market west of, of um, uh, New Orleans. So um, a lot of opportunity there. Next, please. Uh, and so again, I've mentioned places like depots, where if you look at the historic plans, you will see um, the identification of a Negro waiting room and a white waiting room and baggage rooms and so forth. Um, theaters as, as well, whether by design or through practice that were routinely segregated. Um, any antebellum property in the South for sure, um, but certainly not limited to those properties. But again, these are the ones, if you're interested in doing this, um, these are the ones that are probably uh, uh, most in need and might be a little bit easier to start with. Next, please. So I have been working with Dr. Tara Dudley, who teaches uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, she, she teaches a class called um, African American Experience in Architecture. She's also an expert in, in, in interiors. And so she has had seminar students um, looking at um, previously listed properties. And so we are working on an informal basis to have um, student work become the basis of um, new National Register um, um, amendments. And so one of these is for the Neil Cochran House for which he has been doing extensive documentation and her students have been doing a lot of work um, on the property itself and providing context for the neighborhood it's in. Next please. So this property is adjacent to a historic Freedmen's community called Wheatville. And, uh, and so here on the Neil Croc Cochran House property is the former slave quarters there in plain sight. Um, it's the only documented slave quarters in the um, in city of Austin. And so this is obviously ripe for a new interpretation and documentation. And so these are the sorts of projects that, um, that doc, Dr. Dudley and I are um, looking forward to collaborate on in the future. Next. And that's it for me. I neglected to put my email on here, but I can keep it real easy and say it's NR as in National Register at THC, Texas Historical Commission, dot Texas dot gov. And uh, you'll be able to reach me that way if you have any questions about uh, specific properties or any of the approaches that we've taken today that we can't get to through the question and answer period. Thank you. All right, Greg, thank you very much. Uh, Lena, you may want to unmute. Uh, we've got, got a few minutes left. And I've been frantically typing away at the Q&As as best as I can, but I did leave uh, some of them to answer uh, from us. <clears throat> so I'm just going to work my way down. 
Uh, we may not be able to get to all that all of them in the next few minutes, but I'm going to try. Uh, from Caitlin, how has the NPS and SHPO addressed how integrity is assessed for African American sites? These sites largely don't have a standard level of integrity, however, they have ample significance. And what I would like to say is the, the flexibility of the seven aspects of integrity are, are, are built in to helping you uh, assess what is the most important aspect of integrity as it relates to the significance of the, the resource. In this case, it may be a building, it may be a collection, a, a historic district. So what we're looking for is an explanation of how the significance of the resource is reflected in its current appearance. So you may have artificial siding, you may have windows changed, you may have uh, additions or subtractions or the condition may not be good. What we're looking for is an explanation of why the building or the district or whatever the resource is still retains sufficient integrity to reflect it, its significance. So we, we don't have a hard and fast rule that says it must have this, it must have that. What we're asking for is a reasoned explanation for why it has sufficient integrity. Anybody else wanna jump in on that? Um, sure, I would like to add that um, I feel that there often can be unintended class bias and how properties are evaluated for eligibility in terms of their integrity. Um, Properties may not ever have had great workmanship or great design and materials. Um, and it doesn't matter because that's not what, what makes the property significant. It's significant for an association with an event or a person um, or a type, a resource type. Uh, you know, great example being shotgun, shotgun houses um, in some states. Um, and I, I, I always caution people not to say that a property doesn't have integrity just because it, it doesn't have fine quality materials. And I also uh, think it's important to take into account the context of the alterations that may have been undertaken. Um, for sometimes the installation of aluminum siding for instance, was a huge improvement for a building. And it should not be, it, for the property owner, it was a big deal to have it installed. And so preservationists, I think, are incorrect to come back and say, oh, well, it's been altered and it doesn't have integrity. Um, I think that's a, I think that's too limited of a view. Um, so I, I, I wrote this in one of the, um, Q and A uh, questions. Um, an example here in Virginia that is always at our forefront is African American churches. From Reconstruction up through the mid 20th century, most of those churches were frame construction, especially in rural areas. And often, as soon as they had the resources, the congregation would put a brick veneer on those buildings um, because to them that was a symbolic of of what they wanted to convey about their property and their congregation. And so, you know, we would not say that a building that got a brick veneer in 1970 lost its integrity because uh, the motivation for that alteration is uh, part of the property significance. It's association with a congregation that maybe has endured since 1870 and Reconstruction and the Jim Crow era and the Civil Rights Movement and things like that. And by 1970, in their context, in addition to all those historic periods, they also had changing financial circumstances and were able to get a brick veneer finally. So I, I would I would strongly advise anybody who's worried about integrity um, on on properties to make sure that they're not looking at it through a class based lens. All right, our next question from Eric. <clears throat> Have NPS ever given thought to allowing a rolling period of significance? Well, not exactly sure what you might mean by that, but we do have a lot of flexibility in 
the quote 50 year rule. It's not actually a rule. What, what we have is a criteria consideration that says that properties that have achieved significance within the last 50 years must demonstrate that exceptional importance. Exceptional importance uh, can mean many things and exceptionally important at a local level does not necessarily mean exceptionally important at a national level. What I encourage my uh, states when they're submitting nominations to do is to acknowledge that a property may have continued significance while still claiming a period of significance that ends at the arbitrary 50 year period. So if you have a historic commercial district uh, where the, the commercial viability and importance of the downtown continued up to a point, it may be to the present or it may be to a point where an interstate was finally completed and sucked a lot of the business away from the downtown. Acknowledge that in the nomination, but use the 50 year period for that submission. By acknowledging the, the potential or continued significance later in time, it makes it much easier to justify amending it at a later date. So, um, and if, if the, the real period of significance, something that is easily defined, cuts into the 50 year period for a little bit, then we don't really ask that you try to justify that. So we'll, we'll say, you know, let it go uh, two, three, four years into the 50 year period, use the real uh, period of significance. Yes, and, and that's the strategy that we take advantage of, of uh, whenever possible. Uh, one of my interests, especially after doing this for as long as I have and seeing um, how quickly no older nominations became outdated was right. I have an interest in making sure that the nominations have you know, a shelf life beyond the year that it's listed. And so whenever possible, um, if there's a, any chance of making a case for exceptional significance, I'll always advise an applicant, let's, let's try it and see what happens. Um, one of the things I believe very firmly in is not having our state office be more strict than the Park Service. Um, if the Park Service allows it, there's no reason for us to stand in the way if somebody wants to try something new, something, something different, something that maybe, you know, is not done uh, as frequently in other states. Uh, I want this to be as open a process as possible. It makes it more interesting. It gives the nominations more of a shelf life and it makes the whole program yeah. more relevant to, to more, uh, more people. Yeah, on, on that same point, uh, we get a lot of multiple property cover documents, multiple property submissions that have specific dates right there in the title that it makes no sense unless you're doing something like New Deal Resources of Texas. Well, obviously, it's going to be 1933 to 1942 because that's a, a specific period of, of, of time. But if you're doing, you know, um, residential resources of Fort Worth don't end it at 50 years because they still build houses. They have been. So leave it open-ended so that that multiple property cover document can be amended in the future to acknowledge more recent things. Um, from Scott, we have a district that was listed 25 years ago, and took 20 years to become local. Can we amend the district to include previously ineligible properties and also expand without having to re-survey the entire district. This sort of re relates to one uh, earlier with a woman named, I think it was Caitlin. Um, if you're increasing the boundary, doing what we call a boundary increase, that boundary increase stands alone. It, it, uh, is evaluated on its own merits, and uh, we look at the resources only within that boundary increase. If you are doing uh, an amendment to an existing district, um, unless you're trying to establish that one building in there is changing its 
status from contributing to non-contributing because something has changed about that building, uh, remove a slip cover or something like that. Uh, we do not recommend doing them piecemeal. We would recommend that you really reevaluate the entire district, especially if you're adding an area of significance or changing a period of significance, because now you have to evaluate those resources based on that new area and or period of significance. Um, Zachary was talking about uh, how communities can go about updating nominations, but weighing that against the cost. And that is, that is an issue. Um, I've always been a firm believer when I worked for a state office uh, until now that the nomination process should be accessible. It, it shouldn't be rocket science. And sometimes the expectations of various review boards can be a little high and stringent, but the state preservation office is there uh, to, to help in the process. And I believe that any community organization should be able to find someone who can string some sentences together, who can create a nomination or, or an amendment to a nomination without having to hire a, a professional. That's my opinion. I, I'd also say when it comes to review boards that are maybe not as open-minded, because uh, we can't always choose who our review boards are at the state level. Uh, is uh, as an applicant, know, know your rights, know the regulations. There, there is an appeal process. There is a way to see to it that your nomination is considered. Um, I always recommend uh, to, you know, certainly to my staff, to my students at UT um, and applicants as well, read the regulations or I'll, I'll help interpret them so everybody knows what the rules are and what your rights are. Uh, that's that's very important because it's they're they're laid out. That's those are the rules of the game, and it, it's easier to play when you know what the rules are. All right, I've got two more that I want to get to in the next two minutes, so I'll try very quickly. April France, we're working on an amendment for a church listed under C. We'll be adding A and B. The criterion C description is not factually wrong, but lacking by today's standards. Does the first time preparer need to rewrite the C portion or can they just focus on new documentation? They do not have to address the previous criterion. You can submit it only under uh, the new documentation under A and B if you like. And Kirsten, how do you assess proposed amendments to remove criteria of significance that were present and accepted in the original or existing nomination? We have a case where a park was listed in 1999 with un under a, B, and C. The state board is considering a proposed amendment to remove B and C as significant and only list it under A. The original nominator is vehemently opposed, saying that the site has not lost significance in the last 50 years. Well, one of, one, one of the um, uh, conditions under which a property can be removed from the National Register would apply here, and that is um, error in professional judgment or new information that demonstrates that it didn't meet the, the criterion. So if you can provide us information that justifies removing a criterion, that's as valid uh, uh, an amendment as adding a criterion. All right, I think we are butting up against four o'clock and I may not have gotten to all the answers. Um, I apologize, but we have a limited amount of time and uh, the National Register is a topic that can take a while. So uh, Rhonda. Yeah, thanks to uh, Jim and Lena and Greg for your wonderful knowledge and experience on this topic and um, answering nearly all the questions. I think there were dozens of questions that you typed an answer to, Jim, so thank you. And others, uh, thank you for that. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in to our final post-conference workshop for Pass Forward 2021. Thanks all. <laughs>